If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new person, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We have been enjoying an opportunity on Sunday mornings to, to really immerse ourselves in the gospel and to celebrate the truth that Jesus brings new life. Just by a show of hands, how many of you would attest to that truth? Jesus brings new life. Yeah. He really changes lives. And if you missed the last two Sundays, I would encourage you to connect online through either YouTube or the, the podcasts and, and to connect with the sermons. Um, Pastor John, as he's done for years and is so skillfully gifted to do, shared the gospel and gave an opportunity for us to respond. And over the last two Sundays, we saw 17 people respond to make professions of faith. And that's worth celebrating, yeah. 17 people that either for the first time or to come back to the Lord make professions that Jesus, you alone are Lord and bring new life. And we're gonna continue and even crescendo this little mini-series on the gospel today through a focus and a time on baptism. You see, we've gathered here on this cold January morning to witness, to give testimony, to celebrate that Jesus is a savior, that Jesus changes lives, and that Jesus alone, let me say that again, Jesus alone gives new life. He's Savior and Lord. See, this morning, there are at least half a dozen people who plan to follow the Lord in what we call believer's baptism. And this morning, for our time together in the Word, we're going to consider, we're going to consider the priority and the pivotal step that baptism is for believers in Jesus. See, listen to me. The new life that Jesus gives, the gift of salvation, the right to become, as John would say, a child of God and to be completely forgiven, set free from the power of sin, be brought into a family, the church, and to be given a future is by grace. It's by grace. Have any of you ever known a child, like you've seen one before or been connected to them? I have six of them that live in our home. And a phrase that's often heard from the lips of a child is, well, that's not fair. And I would say, welcome to life. Life is not fair. Did you know that favor isn't fair? That's why it's favor. Do you know what would be fair for me or you? Death. That's what's fair. But by grace, through faith, you and I are forgiven. You and I are free. You and I are part of a family. You and I have a future because of Jesus. That's not fair. It wasn't fair to Jesus. He died my death so that I could have those things. See, it's by grace, through faith, and who Jesus claims to be and what he accomplished on the cross and rising from that borrowed, emptied tomb. See, salvation, new life in Jesus, don't miss this because we're going to dive into the waters of baptism today, but you need to know this. New life in Jesus is freely given. We'll learn this together that baptism is somewhat of a confirmation, but it's not like a confirmation number when it's time to get on the plane. Like you don't show up to heaven and go, here's the baptism certificate, now where's my seat? No, that's not what baptism is. It doesn't save you. Oh, it does a confirming thing and we'll talk about that, but Jesus and Jesus alone is the one who saves you. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. You just receive freely the gift that he's given. That's why, dear friends, let me see your eyes. It's called good news. That's what the gospel means. This is good news. 
Let us be bearers of good news in the way our face looks when we interact with people that don't know the good news. Salvation should bring joy and peace and hope and long-suffering, the ability not to get frazzled at every freakout that comes in life. Because Jesus is alive. This new life in Jesus is freely given but costs Jesus everything. Listen to how the Apostle Paul so beautifully states this in the book of Philippians. Just going to read it to you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Paul writes this, Though he was God, he did not think equality with God as something to cling to. Well, that's my position. No. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself even further in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Salvation is free to you and me because of what Jesus did. See, this morning, we're thankful for those who've recently made professions of faith to come home to the Lord. And that plan to this morning, follow him, follow him in obedience through baptism. You don't earn salvation through obedience. It's freely given. But baptism is a step of obedience. So so here's what I want to do this morning. This morning, I think we need to be reminded that new life in Jesus doesn't, doesn't like end. Well, I got saved. New life in Jesus doesn't end with a profession of faith. It begins there. It begins there. One of my professors used to tell me this. Neil, the grace of God is like a loaf of bread. Salvation is just the first slice. Your life with the Lord is lived by grace, by his empowering. See, this morning, I want to take time to consider why baptism is such a priority, even a pivotal step for believers in Jesus. See, baptism's important place in Scripture, baptism's impact on your perspective as a new believer, and baptism's incredible profit to you as a maturing believer, this is what I want to share with you this morning. The priority of baptism. Let's put the first point on the screen, because this is what I want to unpack for you this morning. See, baptism is priority because of its important place in Scripture. Let, there's so many that I could share, but let me just share four places in the New Testament that highlight this truth. The Great Commission. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Listen to the words of Jesus. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Oh, Christians, if you could rest in that truth. In the climate that we live in, where there's so much chaos and so much speculation and so much worry and so much anxiety, believe the Bible, dear saints, where Jesus says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, I have something for you to do. Watch the news every day. No. I have something for you to do. Oh, I should be doing something? Go and make disciples. This is the calling on your life. I don't want you to live the entirety of your Christian experience and not know your job description. That'd be terrible. What was I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be going and making disciples. Well, how do I do that? Oh, I'm so thankful for Jesus because he's not ambiguous. Here's what he says. All the nations, everyone needs to know this. Can't be just us four and no more. As soon as I get my Christian crew, I'm good. I don't need to keep, no, I'm keeping, I'm keeping moving forward. I'm reaching people. Go into all the nations. What should we do? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all the commands I've given you and know this and encourage them in this. I am with you always. Point people to an, a life-changing experience in a relationship with Jesus. That's what baptism signifies. Teach them to think accurately and let them know I'm with them. I'm with them. I'm with them. There's your job description, church. Help people see they can have new life in Jesus. Help them know who Jesus is and help them live in his power. 
You can do that. If God's called you to it, he will equip you to do it. See, baptism is priority because of its important place in Scripture. Jesus, before he ascends to heaven, can you imagine the importance of that moment? It's greater than that first speech that the president gives. This is Jesus' inaugural speech as he ascends and gives his disciples a job description. He says, I want you to go make disciples and to baptize them. That's important. Listen to the words of Peter on Pentecost Sunday. He gave a powerful sermon. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Listen to Peter's words. He says, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Peter, when he's preaching and 3,000 souls are added, he points to baptism as something for them to participate in. It's seen in the Great Commission. It's seen as a powerful point in that first sermon to the early church. It's even seen as a first step for a new believer. Say, what do you mean? Acts chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, there's this guy named Philip. Philip the evangelist. Love that guy. He sees someone riding on a chariot, a eunuch, begins to have a conversation with him. The eunuch's reading the Bible, book of Isaiah. And he asks this question in verse 34, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else, Philip? So beginning with this scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. And as they rode along, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop and they went down to the water and Philip was baptized. He believed in Jesus. Baptism didn't save him. But what did he want to do immediately? He wanted to be baptized. Why? We'll, we'll unpack that momentarily. But listen, it's priority because of its important place in Scripture, the Great Commission, the Sermon on Pentecost Sunday. It's seen as a first step for a believer. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, here's the thing. In the early church, it was like assumed. You know what I assume today? You've got deodorant on. I'm assuming that. That's just life. That's how we do it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, Paul writes, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. It's not like, hey, who am I speaking to? What kind of Christians? Those that value baptism, those that don't. Those... No, this is, like, this is what we do, church. Like when we profess faith in Jesus, we baptize. It was assumed in the early church. Why? During the era and dynamic of the culture at the time that this was written, a person who converted from one religion to another was often baptized. See, in Gulf Breeze culture, when we think of baptism, we think of the Christian faith. But I don't know if you know this, but the Bible wasn't written in the 21st century in Gulf Breeze in English. It was written in a different century, in a different geographical area, at a different time, with different customs and different languages. If you want to apply the Bible well to your life, don't you ever ask the question, what does this mean to me? Ask the question, what does this mean? And how do I apply it to my life? See, culturally, baptism was the means for making a public decision. Those who refused to be baptized were saying this, I don't believe this. So in the minds of the apostles and the early disciples, the idea of an unbaptized Christian was unheard of. It's like, what do you mean? You, you won't publicly declare that Jesus is Lord? Well, why? What's the problem here? See, when a person claimed to believe, believe in Christ, yet was ashamed to proclaim his faith in public, the indication was that he did not have true faith. That's why it was assumed in the early church. Because see, as a Christian, you don't add Jesus to your life like a supplement. Like, all right, for my sweet tea, I want stevia. I don't want like, you know, the, no. Or like, you know, for this, I want honey on this biscuit. Or I'm just going to add it to my life. Many of us sometimes see Jesus as an additive to our life, a supplement. Well, my family's not doing well. Let me get some Jesus in there. Or my, my mind is all kind of confused. Let me just get my worship on. Like, what? Like, no, 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 no. It's a surrender to Jesus. It's confessing him as Savior and Lord. It, it's a whole new life. 
That's what it means to be a believer. See, here's this first and, and simple point. Baptism is important. It's priority because of its important place in Scripture. But there's a second thing I want to share with you this morning. We'll put it up on the screen. Baptism is priority because of its impact on your perspective as a new believer. As we share this truth this morning, this is the one that I'm hoping most connects. This is where there's a lot of disconnect when it comes to baptism. So I'm praying as I'm speaking that I can serve you well by explaining this well. I hope you hang with me. Baptism is a priority because of its impact on your perspective of what it means to be a believer. What do you mean by that? Perspective is an important thing. It's often the difference of why one life is lived well and one is not. The same circumstances. Perspective. How you interpret what's happening. Clarity is helpful. I remember being seventh grade Neil and could not see the board from the back of the classroom. And my teacher and my mom saying, yep, I think you need to get your eyes checked. All right, so I go get my eyes checked. I'm like reading all those numbers and letters and I get a prescription. I step outside and I actually said, you can see blades of grass I mean, you can see those leaves. I thought it was just until you got close, you could see what's going on. I couldn't believe that when you saw something, oh, I can actually tell who that is. My perspective completely changed because my sight was made right. Everything in life isn't as fuzzy as it could be because I see like I'm supposed to. Everything in life, let me say this, once I could see, was more fruitful and more fun. God's plan for your life and mine is that you would come to know Jesus as Savior. God's plan for your life and mine through every aspect of your life is that you would become more like him. That's why baptism is such an important and pivotal step. You say, what do you mean? Baptism is simply an outward testimony of what God has done inwardly. It illustrates the believer's identification with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, Paul writes this, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized in Christ were baptized into his death, buried with him through baptism and death, in order that just as Christ was raised from from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may have new life? Baptism is a picture of death to life. The action of being immersed in water pictures being buried with Christ. The action of coming out of the water pictures Christ's resurrection. And I believe there are two requirements that must be met if someone's to be baptized. They've trusted in Jesus as their savior and they know what baptism is. That's it. Yes, Jesus, your Lord the eunuch with Philip, and there's some water. I understand what this means. Let's do it. See, you could be here today not planning to get wet, but if you've never professed Jesus through baptism, you say, man, there's nothing that prevents me. I know that Jesus is Lord, and I understand what this means. But here's why it's such an important and pivotal step for every believer. I pray you don't miss this, and so I'm just going to read it so that I can communicate it well. If a person knows Jesus as Savior and understands that Christian baptism is a step of obedience in publicly proclaiming his or her faith in Jesus and desires to be baptized, there's no reason to prevent the believer from being baptized. say, okay, I understand that. Why are you stressing this point? This is simple but it'll change your entire Christian experience if you get this truth. What's the truth? According to the Bible, Christian baptism is simply a step of obedience, a public proclamation. Let me say that again. A step of obedience, a public proclamation. In baptism, you're saying this. 
my life is forfeit. It belongs to you. Can you imagine if Christians lived that way? This is why baptism is priority and pivotal for your Christian experience. Why? Because in baptism, you're saying this. My life is forfeit. My peace, my joy, my hope is not found in my family background my marital status, my net worth, my interests, my hobbies, my profession, my preferences, my opinions, my geographic location, my race, my gender, my chemical makeup, or my personality type. That is not who I am. I belong to you. Can you imagine how the world would change if Christians knew who they were. I'm yours. I'm yours. These other things don't define me and they don't impact me. You can take all that away. and I'm still good. I'm still good because I know who I am. I belong to Christ. Jesus, who you say that I am, that's who I am. I identify with you. And I follow you. Please don't miss this. This is why I'm stressing this. I now follow you in obedience. That's how decisions are made. What do you want? That's what's done. Not what I want. Not what I wish for. Not what I worry about. God, what you want done is done. See, one of the roles and functions in my job description as your lead pastor is to serve and oversee Coastline Christian Academy. I love that we have a school on campus with a little over 100 preschool and elementary kids every day. Man, I feel like I have that at my house, but it's fun to come here and see it there too. But I love that I get to share with them on most weeks in their chapel service on Wednesday. A couple of weeks ago, we were walking through the story of Genesis chapter 11 on the Tower of Babel. Babel. And in that story, we see that God did not confuse the language of the people so that he could stop the construction of the tower because he was insecure about their accomplishments or because he's a cosmic killjoy. You see, after the ark, God gave a very clear instruction that the people were to spread out all over the earth. But instead, please don't miss this. You may think I've just gotten off on a tangent, but hang with me. Instead, they stayed right where they were, doing their will in their way. And God said, no, no, no. I'm going to confuse your language. You're going to do what I want you to do. And here was the takeaway truth. As God's people, we are to do God's will in his way. Not our will in our way, but every day trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to. So we're gonna do today what we did on that day. Say, what do you mean? We're gonna learn this truth. We're gonna start on this side. Here's what we're gonna do, team. I'm going to say, trust and obey, and you're going to repeat it. Ready? One, two, three. Trust and obey, obey. for there's no other way way. to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Okay. Now it's your turn. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Okay, let's stand together and say this in unity. Why am I stressing this point? Because baptism shows, Jesus, I trust you and I obey you. Let's say it together. We'll do, I think you guys, you can do better than a three-year-old. You don't need to repeat it again, right? We can do this together. Took a couple rounds. We had to start singing it. We can sing and dance if you'd like to. No, no, no. We'll just say it together on the count of three. Well, let's do the repeat one time. I'm a little scared. I don't know if you got it. (laughs) Trust and obey. obey. For there's no other way way. to be happy in Jesus Jesus. but to trust and obey. obey. Let's say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.
Okay, you can be seated. Give yourself a round of applause. You did a good job. Okay, listen. Why am I stressing this point? Christian baptism is important and pivotal. Why? Because it's a step of obedience. I'm doing what you told me to do, and I'm doing it publicly. Whew. That's hard as you walk with the Lord. And he says, I want you to do this, and I don't want you to be ashamed of it. Well, Jesus, I thought I just added you to my life. Baptism is an important and pivotal step for you because it rightly aligns your perspective of who Jesus is in your life. He is not your homeboy. He's not first your best buddy and you're, you're walking the beach partner. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus is God, king. Now, he is those things. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother, which is amazing to me because of who he is. But align your perspective rightly. You don't, you know, like, you, you never said no to Lord. Those words don't work in that relationship. If the Lord says, do this, you go, yes, sir. That's what I'm doing. You're Lord. Through baptism, you're beginning your journey of discipleship with the right attitude and the right action. Through baptism, you're beginning your journey of discipleship with the right belief and the right choice. And life is made of the sum of your choices. Choose rightly. Some of life's biggest challenges are settled in baptism. What do you mean? My identity. I belong to Jesus. My activity. It's what he wants. That's what I do. It's not, God, what's your will for my life? Wrong question. You'll get the wrong answer. The question is, God, what is your will? And how does my life see that it's done? There's the right answer. Some of life's biggest challenges for people are insecurity. They don't know who they are. They had a bad dad who didn't father them well. They had a bad expression of what love is. The church they were a part of didn't function the way God told it to function, so therefore they hate the church. Identity is huge for Christians, for the unchurched, for human beings. You know who you are? You're free. You're forgiven. You're part of a family. You have a future. That's who you are. You're a king's kid, a royal priesthood. You're the one that the, the king of the universe would say, that's my bride, the church. That's who you are. And your life as one who's forgiven and free, part of a family and has a future, is forfeit. It's not about you. Activity, the what, the how, the when, the where, it's what he says. That's what goes. Don't miss this. Tune in here. You know who you are and you know what you're to be doing. Trusting and obeying that Jesus is the lifeblood of enjoying new life in Jesus. If you don't know how to trust and obey, you will not have an enjoyable Christian life. It'll be drudgery for you. That's not what God wants. He wants you to journey with him, to adventure with him, to take steps of faith, to see him produce fruitfulness in ways that only he can. You will only ever enjoy your life with Jesus as you commit to trust him and obey him. You know why, right? To trust and obey, for there's no other way. It's a song. No other way to be happy in Jesus. Baptism is tangible for that. I'm trusting you. And we have it so easy. What do you mean? And when Paul's writing this to Christians, baptism was to stand in the face of Rome and say, Caesar is not Lord. It's a big deal. For us, it's like, oh, let's do it. And, and it's, it's 76 degrees. It's warm. We got towels. We got T-shirts. Like, no one's coming to kill you. Like, in that day, you were signing your death certificate. I'm, I'm being baptized. I'm saying that Caesar isn't Lord. And I'm doing it publicly. Oh, that the church would know who she is. Follow the Lord. The culture would be changed. Radically changed. 
If your life was forfeit and you just walked in obedience. Why did you turn to Colossians 3? Because of right now. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. You could break this chapter down into those two parts. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 is identity. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 25 is activity. I think I have enough time to do what I was hoping to do. I wanted to read this chapter in its entirety. Is that okay to read a whole chapter on a Sunday morning? Or is that just too much Bible for the South at a church? We can do it. Back row, are you guys good with the Bible, whole chapter? Okay, here we go. It's 25 verses. Listen to what Paul writes. This is your identity, sweet church, verses one through three. Paul writes this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Why? Here's your identity. For you died. It's over for you. It's not about your passions and your pursuits and your glory and preferences and opinions. What is it? You died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what life is. It's about Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. If you're living for glory on this side of eternity, how can you ever enjoy glory on the next? Makes no sense to me. So what should we do then with our lives? Here it comes, dear church. Like, I don't know what to do as a Christian. Not after today. You've read the Bible. Listen to verses 5 through 25. Here's what he says. Put to death sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do. Nothing to do. Streaming services mean this. Nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed. I feel like that's why streaming exists. You don't have it. You should. Here it is. It's the greed machine, right? Greed. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of the world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, when your life was just your own. But now is the time, listen to this dear sweet church, to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him in this new life. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, vaxxed or unvaxxed, barbaric or uncivilized. That was not in there, but slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be holy people, he loves. What should I do every day? There's things I don't do. Now here's what I do. I clothe myself with tenderhearted mercy. Be kind to people. Humility. Gentleness. Patience. Make allowance for others their faults. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace. Be thankful on Thanksgiving. No, always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all of its richness, may that fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And then he says this. This is where it gets real. See, I can do that. Anyone I meet at Starbucks, I'll be kind. I'll even pay their tab. I'm paying it for the person behind me. And then listen to what he says. Wives, submit to your husbands. What? as is fitting to who belongs to the Lord. Husband, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, don't aggravate your children or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching. Serve them sincerely because you're reverent fear of the Lord. Work 
willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. Remember, the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward. And that the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do wrong, you'll be paid back for the wrong you've done. For God has no favorites. Your identity and activity throughout the whole of your life is knowing who you are and then walking in obedience to him. That's why baptism is priority and pivotal because of its impact on your perspective as a new believer. Now I see how life is meant to be lived and I'm taking my first step. Jesus, I'm yours. My life is forfeit and I am now forgiven and free, part of a family and I have a future. And I'm walking with you. Let me share with you an equation that I had to memorize to keep me stable. Here it is. Him plus them equals the win. I serve him and I serve them. That's why I'm here. That's what life is. God, I serve you by serving people. I'm successful. Does that make sense? It's not, oh, I've reached that place. I no longer have debt. Now I'm successful. But it's coming for you. There'll be something else. I finally got married. No more problems. Well, good Lord, you you have no idea. (laughs) I finally reached the position. I finally got the third home. Finally bought my own island. It just never ends. So how do I define a win, a success, a faithful, a fruitful life? God, I served you. And I served your people. See, so far this morning, we've we've learned two things. Baptism is priority because of its important place in Scripture. Baptism is priority because of its impact on your perspective as a new believer. Now, there's a third and final point. We'll put it up on the screen, and it won't be as long as the second one. Don't worry. The second one is what I needed to share. But I need you to be, I need you to know this, because I know this is mainly who I'm speaking to. Those of you that are growing in your walk with the Lord. There's incredible profit that comes from baptism as you walk with the Lord. So what do you mean by that? I'll never forget being in Oregon. The voice that you heard on the intro is a guy by the name of John Corson. I love John. He's like a, a friend to me, a father of sorts to me. Not a perfect man, but a helpful one. And I remember being in a discipleship school with him and a few other guys living in Oregon, and he asked this question, what's the secret to life? And we're all like Bible students trying to learn from the Yoda of Calvary Chapel is what it felt like, and we're like, I have to know Jesus to glorify him. Nope, what, that's not the answer, Jesus? That was Sunday school, we always were told. What do you mean that's not the answer? We're like, what do you mean that's not... He said, take your Bibles and turn to John 15. And I'll read you the verse that he shared with us. And he said this, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father. He said, you want to know the secret to life as a Christian, as someone who knows Jesus? It's growth. It's fruitfulness. That's what starts to motivate you to move forward. God, I want to become more like you. And I want to see others know you. I want to be more like you. And I want people to know you. Oh, you found the secret. There it is. That's what life's about. Through whatever your hand finds it to do, like it says in Colossians chapter 3. It's not going into the ministry If you go into Christianity, you are in the ministry. That's how it works. If you think that taking some full-time, part-time internship at a church is, now I'm in ministry. You always were. You always were. What you do is a service unto the Lord and people. We are not saved to stay where we are. Remember our equation. Him plus them equals the win. Christian life is hard, especially if you want to make a difference. If you want to grow, prepare to get hit from within and from without. 
The enemy of your soul will constantly bring doubt and confusion, depression and rejection, fear and anxiety, lust and greed, selfishness and laziness, pride, imagination, and speculation is coming for you if you want to grow all the time. It's coming for you. But you need to know this. God is for you. If he's for you, who can stand against you? And here's the thing about God. He actually wants you to do well. Can you believe that? Here's the thing about God. He doesn't leave you without what you need to move forward and be fruitful. And they're things that you miss because they're so simple. The people of God is what you need. The church. I don't come to church so I can learn more about the Bible. That's not why I'm here. I mean, it's part of it. I want to learn the Bible. But I am wired for community, to be in fellowship, to be connected and encouraged, strengthened, strengthen others. That's the part of, that's the, one of the biggest pieces about church is people connecting with people, encouraging one another in their walk with the Lord. God gives you the church. He gives you his spirit to change you from the inside out. He gives you his word. And this may sound foreign to us, but he gives us the sacraments of communion and baptism. You say, what do you mean by that? Jesus left us with two, what we call in this era, sacraments. Communion. Do you remember that where he's in the upper room and he's telling his boys, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And we remember Jesus through communion. What's the second one? Baptism. These have been practiced by the church for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why? Because it's just what we do. It's what all good Christians do. We don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't go with people that do, and we we get baptized and we take communion. No! Communion and baptism, they bring incredible profit to your life with Jesus. I don't have them up for you on the screen, but I'm going to give you eight reasons. Eight is the number of new beginnings. So I'm going to give you eight reasons why baptism is an incredible profit to your soul. Here's the first one. Affirmation. Baptism is a picture of death, burial, and resurrection, and it is affirming that Jesus is Lord, that he died, that he rose again, and he's alive in you. Affirmation. You're affirmed. Baptism brings you that profit to your soul when you're baptized and when you witness it. Number two. Declaration. It is an outward sign of an inward reality. Baptism is the mechanism through which I say, I belong to Jesus. It's a declaration. I remember a season in my life when I only had four children, three girls and a little boy. And our little boy, Liam, came out as a fiery redhead. I've got three fiery redheads in my tribe. And Liam, my first boy, I remember when he was like two or three, you know what he used to love to declare every morning as he was learning words? Fight, fight, fight. That's what he wanted to do. Lily, Lucy, and Layla, my first three, it was not fight. It was like flowers and Anna and Elsa, and that's what we did. And then this little redheaded Liam came, and he wanted to wrestle and fight. And like every morning with his cup of Cheerios and orange juice, he would fight. You know, that's how he, he was declaring And through baptism, we're declaring, forgiven, free. I'm part of the family. I've got a future. Baptism is your declaration. It's your affirmation. Number three, it's your association with what? Christians everywhere. Christians everywhere. I love local pastors. You know why? I need them. They remind me that I'm not God's gift to the area. You ever met a pastor like that that's kind of like so focused on their own gig, they kind of forget that like the church has existed long before they ever showed up, it'll probably exist long after they're gone, like we need to serve our church well, bless our church, be all about our church, I get that, but then sometimes you go to like meet a pastor and they're like, oh, it seems like he carries a scepter or something, you know what I mean, like what, what in the world, man, like I love local pastors because it keeps me grounded, it helps me realize God's doing a great work all over the place, and it's not about me, I'm a part of this bigger thing. Association, I'm connected 
to an ancient religion and one that is so relevant to today. It's association. That's what baptism is. It's identification, number four, with Jesus outwardly. Jesus, I'm identifying with you outwardly. See, baptism is like this to me. My wedding ring. It identifies me. Mary, it's who I am. And baptism is this place where you identify and say, I'm in love and I don't care who knows it. I'm going to get wet today. I'm following him in believer's baptism. I'm his. Number five, it's a realization. A realization of what? Well, many things. But for some, maybe not our context, I could die because of this. I'm publicly declaring that I belong to Jesus. I love doing ministry in Haiti. By God's grace, got to do that for many years. And I remember some of our outreaches to children. And in that culture, it's not so much in this culture, at least not that we're aware of, uh, voodoo is a, is a highly practiced religion there. And Tony went with us to Haiti sometimes, and many of you guys. And I remember in some of the outreach trips, we would present the gospel, and it would be you know, translated into um, Creole with the Haitian pastors, and kids would respond. And I never saw this before. It's the first time I'd ever seen this. The pastor would have everyone come up who raised their hand, and he would say, are you sure? Do you know what you're doing? You're throwing down that red sash of voodoo, and you're picking up the red blood of Jesus. Do you really want to do that? And some kids would go, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Go, That's okay. You go out and get the food and go play. And some kids would stay and go, now, do you understand what you're doing? You're identifying with Jesus. When you go back, some of these kids were voodoo priest kids. When you go back, you need to tell mom and dad that the, the red voodoo doesn't cover you anymore. Jesus does. Are you sure, little seven-year-old, you're ready to do that? And they would say, yeah, I'm ready. Can you imagine what American Christians would be like, how resourced we are if we had that kind of, that kind of realization? That's what baptism is for some. It's liberation, number six. Paul writes this, have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in, baptize, in baptism, you joined his death for we died and were buried, but just as Christ was raised in glorious power, so now he lives in us. You are liberated from the power of sin. It doesn't have to own you. Baptism is a reminder of that. Two more. Number seven, baptism is a celebration. Man, you know, like we did the math, and in our family, because of where birthdays fall, we eat cake every single month, either because of a birthday or because it's July 4th or something. Like every month, we're eating cake. That's why I wear black. It, you know, kind of helps me. But like, and this is what I mean. It's so, it's, it's, we're designed to celebrate. Have you ever read the Old Testament? You see all those feasts and festivals? Like, it is a good thing to celebrate good things. And celebration that I'm forgiven, and this is what you should celebrate. I love that my dad does this when he baptizes people oftentimes. If they're kind of, you can kind of read how people are sometimes, and they get, they get into the water, and he can kind of tell the person's like, maybe a little down, or, you know, maybe they're just sad over some life choices, or he'll ask this question, hey, are you kind of caught in any sin? And the moment gets a little, you know, somber, and He'll say, I want to remind you that you're forgiven of that. I want to remind you that though you're not perfect, in his eyes you're perfectly clean. Because you know, it's the kindness of God that draws us to repentance so many times. When you understand what sin does to him and what it does to you, you don't want to have anything to do with it. I love this. I'm celebrating. I'm forgiven. Last thing, it's confirmation. We shared about that earlier with our time together this morning. I've heard it, and it's true. People who maybe haven't been baptized often question their salvation because salvation is so personal. It's inward. So if you ask a kid that grew up in church, like, well, when did you get saved? You're like, I don't really know. Well, when did you get baptized? That's when you made that public declaration. For many, Baptism is not confirmation in the sense that you show up to Jesus with your confirmation number and go, see, I'm saved, I was baptized. No, 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 don't misunderstand me. 
It's an inward confirmation. It's a part of that. We go, man, I remember going into those waters. You put the stake in the ground. I'm his. Let me put these three on the screen and then we'll be done. I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team up and then we'll close our time in worship this morning. But these three simple points. Baptism is priority because of its important place in Scripture. Number two, baptism is priority because of its impact on your perspective as a new believer. Oh, I'm his. And whatever he says, that's what I'm doing. And number three, baptism is priority because of its incredible profit for you as a maturing believer.